Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Guys, are you trying to stay in 20-year-old shape into your 30s and 40s and finding it, well, impossible? Then you need to listen to this. Beachbody, the company that revolutionized getting ripped at home with P90X and Insanity, has a brand new program just for you called Lift 4. It's part lift. It's part hit. With total body shredding results in just 30 to 40 minutes a day, right at home on the Beachbody On Demand app. That's how you get killer results as an adult. Go to Beachbody.com to sign up now and you can try Live 4 for free. That's Beachbody.com. Welcome to episode 183 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Kate Schumacher, Barry, Noni Napoleon, Patty Len, Cool Breeze, Nina Namcaro, Christy Deemer, Michelle Nicely, Laura Caprez, Tony Reeve, Megan Slater, Shannon Burrows, Aveen Cullen, Christine Taylor, Charmaine Kane, Kimberly McClurg, Adrian, Mrs. Acorn, Disco Sister, and Raphael Della Tor. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week. Our film review is 1408. 1408 was released in 2007. It has 6.8 out of 10 on IMDb and 78% on Rotten Tomatoes. A man who specialises in debunking paranormal occurrences checks into the fabled room 1408 in the Dolphin Hotel in New York. Soon after settling in, he confronts genuine terror. Now, I did not expect this film to get the response that it did. So if you're not a social media person, every kind of Thursday or Friday, I will post on Instagram, on Facebook, what the film review is going to be for the for the Sunday episode and people people were really taken by this movie some people loved it some people hated it I was quite surprised because I personally had never heard of it I was just doing a little scout around on Netflix and I saw it and I thought oh this looks interesting and actually I checked the IMDB and Rotten Tomatoes before I watched it because I just couldn't face watching another horrendous terrible horror movie I wanted to watch something that was good so you know what I said I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a go and see and my likes this week I really liked John Cusack in this movie I thought he was convincing I thought he carried the story very well and I also I really liked the concept of his character so he plays this jaded horror writer who writes about haunted locations so he'll write about like the top 10 haunted hotel rooms the top 10 haunted graveyards and by all accounts he's this like really cynical bastard who's only doing it for the paycheck seems like he had some stuff going on and couldn't quite make it as what he sees as a more legitimate writer in that he wanted to be a novelist and I, you know what I liked him and this is a Stephen King movie so obviously he has a tragic past and fundamentally I enjoyed his performance I thought that he was really witty and funny and he had a lot of dry humor and his world weariness was entertaining I think he was a character that could be very easily completely unlikable but John Cusack plays him really well. Samuel L. Jackson is also in this film and he's on like the promotional posters for the film so I thought he would have a bigger role but he's in it for like five minutes but I loved his role as well. So he plays a hotel manager who is trying to like toe the line between professionalism and also trying to keep John Cusack out of room 1408 and they have this sort of protracted scene where Samuel L. Jackson is trying to convince John Cusack not to go into the room and it's really good. Like their 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 standoff against each other is really good and Samuel L. is like obviously trying to do the right things in terms of etiquette for the hotel but also trying to keep John Cusack out. And he has a bit of disdain for John Cusack, I think. And you know what? He's there. The, the, the little exchange that they have is really entertaining. And when John Cusack eventually gets into the room, there's this really slow build into the paranormal. And I'm putting paranormal in inverted commas. You gotta, you gotta decide what you will about this film. And as the audience, you obviously know the story about this room. You know all the things that have happened there. And you're kind of on John Cusack's side in terms of he's trying to debunk everything. And there's this really 
great slow build that I thoroughly enjoyed. It felt like a typical haunted house story that was being like played out in this hotel room. And uh, that kind of sums up my likes. (laughs) I'm going to go to my dislikes because I don't want to delve too much into the plot of this story in case people haven't seen it. And I would highly recommend that you watch it if you haven't seen it. It is a refreshing and interesting horror story. I thought it was a really genuinely like creepy and clever concept. Um, And actually I wrote down that it felt like The Shining but condensed into one room. So rather than it being in this big sprawling hotel, it is in one room. But I just thought it went off the rails in the last 20 minutes and I really just wanted it to end. Like I wanted it to end in one way or another. And I don't know if that was supposed to reflect his time stuck in the room. But either way, I was really glad when it was over. And just to be really clear, I understood the concept of the film and I understood why the events in the room were playing out that the, in the way that they were. But it just became a bit tedious and I felt like every time something new and inexplicable was happening in the room I was like oh god I just thought some of the events as well were really random and didn't really add anything to the horror aspects of the story in a way it gave me the same feeling as mother you know that film with Jennifer Lawrence like mother exclamation mark where I watched it and it was like such an assault on the senses to try and keep up like it was such an assault on the brain and in actuality I actually preferred the slow build small paranormal events that were happening in the room I really disliked the use of CGI in this film like really disliked the use of CGI and I get that it was 2007 and obviously CGI has come a long way since then but I felt like the CGI was overused and I wasn't entirely sure why they had done that I thought there would have been much better more effective ways to get the point across of like history repeating itself in a less CGI'd way that actually probably would have been more scary for the audience all in all I don't want to go on about this film for too long because I don't want to ruin it for anybody who hasn't seen it John Cusack definitely the best thing about this film it did keep me guessing I it got a bit to the to me it felt like a bit of an assault on the brain by the end of it but actually I I enjoyed watching it and I'm going to give it three and a half stars so that's three and a half stars for 1408 and now another no-brainer money-saving tip from Progressive (laughs) Marcus what happened (sighs) I was changing my oil and I spilled some on the floor oh we'll use these $50 bills to wipe it up perfect got any more yeah yeah take a couple hundred stop Instead of using money, use an old rag. And here's a better tip from Progressive on how not to waste money. Don't pay too much for car insurance. Drivers who switch and save could save hundreds. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise and eat better, you really can do it. But nobody is going to do it for you. And nobody has to, because you can do it if you have the right tools and a community that cares about helping you get results. And that's us, Beachbody. It's as convenient as your TV or laptop, but you need to decide that you're worth it. Let us help you succeed. Here's how. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great. Which brings us to our story this week. Now, based on the title of this episode, it's going to need no introduction, so let's get straight into it. Tucked away between the New York cities of Buffalo and Rochester sits a menacing yet tragic broken building. In December of 1826, the Genesee County Board of Supervisors met in Bethany for the sole purpose of establishing a poorhouse for the county. An official announcement was made in the newspaper on December the 9th, 1826. Notice is hereby given that the Genesee County Poorhouse will be ready for the reception of paupers on the 1st day of January 1827. The overseers of the poor of the several towns of the County of Genesee are requested in all cases of removal of paupers to the County Poorhouse to send them with their clothing, beds, bedding and such other articles belonging to the paupers as may be necessary and useful to them. The following were those eligible to seek asylum in this facility. Habitual drunkards, lunatics, 
one who by disease, grief or accident lost the use of reason or from old age, sickness or weakness, was so weak of mind as to be incapable of governing or managing their affairs. Paupers, a person with no means of income. State paupers, one who is blind, lame, old or disabled with no income source or a vagrant. The Rolling Hills Asylum first opened on January 1st, 1827 in East Bethany in New York. During its first years of operation, it served as a poorhouse under the name Genesee County Poor Farm. Poor houses were government-run facilities created to support and house the needy and were relatively common in the 19th and 20th centuries in America. The types of people that came to these houses were outcasts, those swept away from civilization. In other words, these types of buildings were filled with what society saw as the unwanted. The Genesee County Poor Farm housed orphans, families, the mentally ill, the physically disabled and most troubling criminals. Most poor houses in America during this time held children, people with physical disabilities and those suffering with various degrees of mental illnesses, but they didn't also hold criminals. For Genesee County Poor Farm to put criminals under the same roof as vulnerable orphaned children and the destitute, it wasn't a common occurrence. This disturbing fact only adds to the lore of the asylum. Residents were referred to as inmates, no matter why they called the facility home. We've covered a number of mental health facilities in the course of the podcast, but none that were so openly flagrant in their disregard for the personal strife of the residents. It seems as though in the eyes of the administration, orphans and the mentally unwell were viewed the same way as criminals, deserving of being locked away with little regard for the consequences. The Genesee County Poor Farm was a 200-acre, self-sufficient campus. It was a working farm, surrounded by woods that provided both food and fuel for its residents. This made the cost of living for each person living there lower than the typical poorhouse rate. In 1871, it cost just $1.08 per week per resident. Those physically able to work the farm did so. Many residents made wares to sell in order to help offset the cost of living expenses. Pigs, horses, chickens and ducks were all raised on the farm. Working vegetable and fruit crops and canning jams, jellies and meats were all part of the regular chores on campus. There was even a bakery and a wood shop. The wood shop made coffins for the local community. They also made coffins for those who died during their stay there. Tragically, over 1,700 people died over the course of the facility's operation. Many were buried on the property in a place called Potter's Field. The county would bury those who had no family and records indicate there was once a cemetery located somewhere on the 200 acres, but the particulars are non-existent. An 1886 proceeding states, The burying ground we have improved by building a fence in front and grading and levelling the ground as much as could be done without injury to the graves. The cemetery has long faded away, as the gravestones crumpled or disintegrated. The grass has grown up around where lost souls were put to rest. With nobody to take care of the plots, the graves of these former residents have been long forgotten. The residents were forgotten and cast aside in life. And sadly, it's no surprise that this would carry on in death. An actual cemetery register or plot map has yet to be discovered. In 1938, a new building opened up as an infirmary. More sick people entered the facility making the overall living condition nightmarish for all the residents. Children were spending time near people suffering from unimaginable and infectious diseases, criminals were working next to the mentally ill, orphans were roaming around the campus unsupervised. It was a catch-all facility that was self-sustainable to help the people in the community. While the facility housed those shunned by society, orphans, widows and the ill and criminals, It is alleged that some of the staff were cruel to the residents. Experimental procedures were believed to have been carried out, including shock therapy. The remains of apparent medical equipment can still be seen in the building. 
This was a dumping ground for people who did not have a home anymore or have anywhere else to go. The last 10 years of operation had served as a nursing home, however due to code violation it was permanently shut down in 1974. Residents currently residing on the property during that time were transferred to new facilities in Batavia, another city in the same county. Hopefully they were treated better. After the facility closed in 1974, supernatural activity was documented by those who spent time in the abandoned buildings. Some former residents that have made themselves known to visitors today are George, Roy, Emma, Jack and the mysterious screaming lady. Most of the spirits at Rolling Hills are helpful and often appear when you call out for help. But that doesn't mean that a visit to the facility today isn't a terrifying experience for those brave enough to enter through those doors. Sharon Coyle has seen it all. As the owner of Rolling Hills Asylum, she is well versed in the ways of the paranormal. She has heard the screams, she has seen the shadows, she has felt the chills and heard the stories. Nothing scares her. Except for rats. That was a different matter altogether. Sharon had been working tirelessly to make sure that the building was safe for visitors and renovated to a point where tours were possible and it was no easy task. Meetings with her handyman were happening almost daily as the list of things to fix grew and grew. Sharon and her handyman stood in the infirmary, deep in conversation as they traced a crack in the wall from floor to ceiling. Their chat stopped as a sharp scratching sound emerged from a corner of the room and they stopped tracing the crack to see if they could find the source. The scratching grew louder as they silently and gingerly stepped around the walls, following the sound that was like nails scraping against wood. As they approached another crack in the wall, they noticed a hole had formed between the wall and the floor, and the source of the scratching became apparent as a rat burst from the wall and shot out across the floor, its feet pattering on the bare floorboards. Sharon screamed in an unholy terror, the scream reverberating around the room and she ran straight out the door of the infirmary and out of the building without a second thought. As she paced outside the building trying to catch her breath, she was joined by the handyman who was also out of breath but from laughter. He laughed uproariously with his hands on his knees, thoroughly amused by the fact that after all this time, and all the strange things that the Rolling Hills Asylum was home to, Sharon was still deathly afraid of the rats. Through all of the panic and laughter, they decided it was time to take a break and have some lunch, and they could reconvene later, when Sharon's heart had slowed to a more regular rhythm. Later in the day, Sharon finally felt as though she was able to go back into the building. She was calm, she was ready, and no rat was going to drive her out, no way. She cautiously made her way back to the infirmary, paranoid that the minute she put her foot through the door she would be swept away in a sea of squirming brown bodies. But the infirmary was thankfully quiet and serene, except for something that was out of place. Something that definitely wasn't there earlier. It was a stain that was on the floor, a small enough stain but large enough to be noticed. She approached the stain and realised that it was blood. The deep brownie red mark was fresh. Her breath caught in her throat as she made out the shape. Very clearly in the splodge were four little legs, a fat body and even the mark of a long tail. It looked like her rat friend had met a sudden and painful demise. But how? She scanned the room, half expecting to see some sort of large predator stalking her from a corner. But instead she saw footprints. Large footprints that were formed on the wall as if someone had kicked it with the flat of their foot. The footprints were bigger than any person she had ever known. In the world of the living at least. The footprints weren't alone because above them were two huge bloody handprints. 
Sharon stood looking at the handprints and the footprints and the rat-shaped blood stain on the floor and softly said, Thank you, Roy. Roy Krauss was afflicted with gigantism, a condition where a tumour on the anterior pituitary gland causes it to secrete too much growth hormone and it makes you bigger. As well as sufferers growing abnormally tall, it also causes disproportionately large hands and feet. When Roy was just 12 years old, his parents dropped him off at the Rolling Hills Asylum and never came back to pick him up. Roy was nearly seven and a half foot tall. He was born on the 4th of March, 1890, and he died on April the 11th, 1942. But his presence can still be felt and seen. Because Roy is partial to a photography appearance or two, as is outlined by Sharon Coyle in her own words on the Rolling Hills Asylum website. We were set up on the far side of the shadow hallway, right outside the solarium. We had all been hearing noises, footsteps, the sounds of furniture moving, distant voices, seeing shadows, all of the usual activity, including hits on the mag light and the melmeter. I used to be the type of person who would take 300 to 500 photos a night on investigations. But owning Rolling Hills Asylum, it's impossible to keep up with the evidence, let alone have a large enough hard drive to store all of it. So now I tend to just enjoy and focus in on my personal experiences and use my camera and recorder judiciously. That being said, we kept seeing so many shadows passing back and forth across the infirmary doorway and heading down the hallway towards us, that when it became super dark, I started clicking off a few photos, pretty confident that it was Roy Krauss, our seven-foot-tall shadow man. Roy was born on March the 4th, 1890, and passed away from a heart attack on April the 11th, 1942, at the age of 52. I encountered Roy for the first time on my first visit to Rolling Hills Asylum on June the 12th, 2008, and he has been my favourite ever since. We seem to have a special connection. I often receive EVP from him and also clear conversations from him via my Frank's box. I believe that Roy was showing himself that evening in response to the earlier activities in Rolling Hills Asylum. I think he was letting me know that all was A-OK and all of Rolling Hills Asylum's spirits were feeling safe. And while Roy spends his time roaming the corridors... It is the spirit of Little Jack that spends his time roaming the tunnels deep below the asylum. In theory, this sounds terrifying. The spirit of a child roaming the pitch-black tunnels beneath the crumbling walls of an old, abandoned asylum. But in reality, the spirit of Jack is described as being childlike and non-threatening. People have reported hearing him laughing and have reported feeling him touching their legs and clothes in an attempt to get their attention. Despite the fact that the tunnels are such an ominous location, it seems that the spirit of Little Jack just wants to play and spends his afterlife ducking and diving in and out of corridors and tunnels of rolling hills in a desperate attempt to play with the living visitors. And as is inevitable with a place like Rolling Hills Asylum, there are numerous reports of the spectre of a nurse that haunts the building and it is believed that her name is Emma. On the Rolling Hills Asylum website, there are testimonies from people who have experienced the paranormal at the location, including the following account from Mary Fleming Dutton. In 1998, my fiancé, now husband, had a herb shop called The Raven's Nest in the room across from what was a little restaurant. A grandson of someone offered to take us upstairs when I told him about the noises I was hearing and I kept seeing a woman in an old-fashioned nurse's uniform walk past our shop door. When I would look down the hall, she would be gone, but you could hear her shoes squeaking. We went upstairs, and the owners had taken all of the doors off and laid them inside the rooms. My husband and the boy, I cannot remember his name, were walking beside me. I've been psychic since I fell six feet onto concrete splitting my head open, I was hearing low murmuring. As we walked past the rooms, one at a time, you could hear the doors slam shut. The boys were walking very fast at this point, but I saw movement from the corner of my eye. I stopped in front of one room and saw an old metal tub with a high back 
an elderly man sitting there in steaming hot water, eyes closed and skin bright red. The woman in white that I had been seeing was leaning over him with a strange smile on her face. Everything happened very fast. The vision was gone, replaced by a room with rubble about the floor. I never saw that woman in front of our shop again. I did always hear murmuring, squeaking of wheelchairs and children laughing. I seem to draw spirits to me if they are around. Maybe because they know I can hear them. It's good to know that this building and its history will be taken care of and I'm sure the spirits will be a bit happier. It is also possible that the woman that Mary saw was in fact the screaming woman. There's a theory as to who she is and no one really knows her true identity. Some believe it could be Phoebe White, the very first resident who moved in when she was only a little girl, back when it was a poor house. She lived there for 56 years. Manny believe the screams they hear are her trying to communicate with visitors. Her frustrated screams have been picked up on by multiple ghost hunting devices and heard by the naked ear. There are myriad examples of EVPs and spirit box sessions online that claim to capture the ghostly voices of Rolling Hills. But I thought it would be fitting to include two of these EVPs for you today that claim to demonstrate the screaming woman in action. The first part of this EVP is from the one and only Ghost Adventures and the second came from the Fifth Dimension Paranormal Investigations. What? Did you just hear that? Who's out there? I just heard that scream. In Shadow Hallway, located on the second floor of the East Wing, people have documented seeing shadow figures. The figures vary from dark black to a pale grey colour. They have been seen walking upright like a person, or crawling on the floor. They can be amorphous shapes or human-like. Sometimes only an appendage appears, such as a leg or an arm. In the basement, there is a room known as the Christmas Room. During its operation, there were many children who called this place home. And during the Christmas holiday, there was a room where the kids could go and meet Santa Claus. The room still has decorations up all around it and people have reported seeing toys move by themselves. The basement also holds a psychiatric ward and solitary confinement cells. There is evidence that shackles were used to restrain residents. If you visit the morgue today, you can still see the embalming table used in practice and the large refrigerators they use to store corpses. Visitors report hearing disembodied voices and poltergeist activity in this room. Some people have even been shoved by a mysterious invisible force. Accounts of feeling like your insides are being scrambled are also recorded by those who have spent time in this room. Subtle touching and loud screams like a mother crying for her child have also been heard in this part of the building. As previously mentioned, there is a cemetery somewhere on the property but its exact location is unknown. The ground has become so unkempt and overgrown the graveyard has been buried by nature and lost to time. There is no site map and no burial record, so the spirits of those buried somewhere beneath the ground may come out for a visit. On the first floor of the main building, an old woman's voice has been recorded saying the word, Hello? The spirits want to be treated with respect and react when they feel like this isn't happening. Despite their friendly reputation, the spirits inside the Rolling Hills Asylum still scare visitors to their core. Seeing a shadow figure lurking in the hallway or hearing the voice of a woman crying out to be seen can be terrifying and life-changing experiences. For those that have visited the asylum, the place is not for the faint of heart. The paranormal activity is undeniable and showcases why it is one of the most haunted locations on the east coast of America.
through the vast amount of supernatural evidence collected by investigators and witnesses. A memorial site was created in the Genesee County Park on June the 6th, 2004, when five headstones dated from 1887 to 1888 were returned to the county. The Genesee County historians dedicated a historical marker honouring those who died while living in the poorhouse from 1827 until the facility was closed in 1974. The Rolling Hills Asylum is located in East Bethany, New York. It is open for public tours and ghost hunts year-round. It has been featured on popular paranormal shows such as Ghost Adventures, BuzzFeed Unsolved, Destination Fear. The hit show American Horror Story also featured the Rolling Hills Asylum in some of the promotional work for the second season American Horror Story Asylum. The Rolling Hills Asylum remains one of the most active paranormal locations on the east coast of America and Sharon Coyle believes that she knows why these spirits are still hanging around. It's the only home that a lot of these people ever knew. They feel attached to this place. Some of them lost their homes. There were widows and orphans and they developed their own family and friends here. So I think a lot of people felt comfortable here. They didn't want to leave. So we treat our spirits like they are really breathing, living people. So let's get into the into the breakdown of this. But before we do, I need to give you some sort of window into my own stupidity. Like I am on paper an intelligent person, but I do think in real life it surprises people how absolutely outrageously stupid I can be at times as I shift around noisily in my chair while recording a podcast. Um, so during during my research for this, um, this is actually really embarrassing, but anyway, during my research for this, I was on the Rolling Hills Asylum website, which I would highly recommend. It's got loads of pictures of the, way, of the asylum. It's got loads of the um, paranormal activity that's, that's, meant to have been captured so you can decide what you think of it do you think it's paranormal do you think it's not it's a really good website to have a look at because it kind of catalogues all of the evidence that people submit which is very interesting and one of the one of the videos was of the owner her name is Sharon doing an EVP or like some sort of spirit box session and in this in this video I was I was having a look at it and you could clearly hear the spirit box say her name is Sharon Coyle. My name is Roy. Right? And I, I literally watched it about 4,000 times and I was like, oh my God, how are they not making like such a big deal out of this? Like, this is amazing. This is incredible paranormal evidence. Like this is so, you know, they talk about intelligent responses on things like ghost adventures. Like this, this spirit box just said her name and the name of the spirit Roy that's meant to be there. Like what the heck? Why is this not like on the news? And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to blow people's minds with this piece of evidence. I'm going to blow their minds. Downloaded the audio, was ready to put it into the episode. And then I realized it was a walkie talkie. It was a man talking on a walkie talkie. It was a real life living man talking on a walkie talkie. So for a brief period of time, I thought I had like solved the paranormal. You know, I thought this is it. This is the evidence. It's right there under their noses. How have they never seen it before? How are they not making a bigger deal out of this? Um, because it wasn't the evidence. It was a man on a walkie talkie. So I'm actually a moron and I'm glad to let you all in on that little secret. So these asylum stories, they kill me every time we do them. Um, as you guys know, like asylum stories have a sort of special place in my heart. I know that sounds a really strange thing to say, but it's where my interest in the paranormal started was 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 asylum stories. It, it does baffle me. It baffles me even back in the 1800s. The lack of care and foresight of the administrators to put all these people in in these poor houses together. And I think a lot of people would be incredibly surprised at how how recently things like this have happened, like mixing, mixing vulnerable people, just all all types of vulnerable people together of all ages. It's never it's not a good thing, especially if if the facility is not equipped to manage the needs of those people effectively. And it's not to say that every criminal is 
out to hurt other people because we don't know why those criminals were put into the poor house in the first place. Maybe their crimes were not deemed um, not deemed bad enough, as it were, to go to the jail. Like, I don't know. But putting criminals, people who are mentally ill, people who have various addictions, people who have mental illnesses, whatever it is, putting all of those people alongside vulnerable children who have nobody to speak for them or nobody for them to go to is really like it really makes me feel funny and you would be surprised at how how recently these these almost experimental mixings of people happened in mental health facilities it's not that unusual and I do firmly believe there are people who go into certain professions in order to assert power and dominance over vulnerable people I absolutely do believe that I also believe that a lot of stories about old asylums come with the inevitable and there were evil doctors and nurses that not might not necessarily be true. It might be true. I think a lot of the nurses and doctors who worked in those facilities at the time worked within the confines of what was available to them and the knowledge that they had and they, they a lot most of them, the majority of them tried their best for their patients. The same as today, the majority of Doctors and nurses and healthcare workers try their absolute level best for the patients that they work with or the inmates, which is an absolutely horrific term to use, really. And a lot of what we would see now as experiments, because that that is that term is always bandied around. You know, they did experiments on the patients. A lot of these experiments would actually have been methods that were being tested in order to alleviate mental illnesses or or addictive personalities or whatever it is that they were trying to trying to fix and I'm using the word fix lightly there are lots of therapies that were used like water therapy you know dunking people into water putting people into really hot baths there was machines that they had that would like spin people around lobotomies all of those things were done to try and alleviate symptoms of mental illnesses addiction even like intellectual disabilities whatever it was so while now we see them as barbaric experiments, which fundamentally they were, they uh, uh, for most of the time they were administered with good intentions. And, you know, intention does not overwrite impact. Of course it doesn't. But I just think that a lot of the lore surrounding these these asylums is uh, is sometimes it's exaggerated and sometimes it is painted in a different way than maybe what it actually would have been like at the time now don't for a second think that I'm saying that it was not a terrible facility because they generally were unfortunately we've become a lot more caring about how we deal with people with mental health issues and and our social services in society fortunately and these places are just inherently sad and I say it every single time if you have a facility like Rolling Hills Asylum, like Waverly Hills Sanatorium, like the building that I used to work in that has seen so much tragedy and so much sadness and loss and such a mix of people in there, there's going to be there's going to be a residual energy. The re- I really firmly believe that. If you think you've got these orphans and widows who by all means are mentally well, healthy it's going to be pretty emotionally traumatic to end up in a facility like that for all of the for all of the people who ended up there. But yet I do think it's interesting that the spirits of Rolling Hills all seem to be relatively benign, you know? There doesn't seem to be any evil shadows lurking trying to like hurt people or scratch people or whatever. The story of Roy, even though I mean the idea of him killing a rat freaks the shit out of me because if you're a spirit and you have the ability to do that, like what else do you have the ability to do? But the spirit of Roy seems to be completely lovely and benign as does the spirit of Jack, the nurse Emma. And can I just say as well also the excitement of coming across a story where one of the uh, main characters, main paranormal characters called Emma. I was loving it. It's not often that that happens. So I very much enjoyed it. Although I did read an article that said that she was a really evil nurse and that she like was into Satanism and black magic and stuff. But again, I feel like that's just legend. Didn't include it in there because I don't want to besmirch the name of Emma. Nobody called Emma could ever have been evil. But like I said, everything seems to be relatively benign. So maybe maybe Sharon Coyle is right. Like maybe, maybe in some way the spirits there, it was home for them and they did find a sense of family and they are trying to look after the people who are now there. 
Like maybe, maybe that is what it is. I am always slightly sceptical of the vast majority of the stories and the evidence coming from the people who own the facility. So I get that, you know, she is out here looking after this building, preserving its history and also is trying to make a living out of it by having ghost tours, etc, etc. But I do think it's it's kind of important to sort of think where are these stories coming from and what might people benefit from these stories being out there. Would I still visit the Rolling Hills Asylum and do I still believe there probably is a lot of energy there? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yes. And as an aside, so I included the EVPs of The Screaming Lady because I just thought it was interesting to include them. Thank you, Zach Bagans, for having a wonderful TV show and clips of which can be found on YouTube. I don't know that that isn't a fox or an animal that people are hearing, to be really honest. I don't know if I'm convinced that that actually sounds human enough for me to think that is a screaming lady. And I don't know about you guys. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I'd love to hear what your opinion is. Let me know. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to send in your own spooky story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for extra content, you can sign up to Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash reallifeghoststories where for $5 a month and $2 a month you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free and on that note I shall see you next time Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise and eat better, you really can do it. But nobody is going to do it for you. And nobody has to because you can do it if you have the right tools and a community that cares about helping you get results. And that's us, Beachbody. It's as convenient as your TV or laptop, but you need to decide that you're worth it. Let us help you succeed. Here's how. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great.